there's a lot of doctors in America who are very smart. You gave them tests on physics and math and everything, they would do very, very well. But you know what? They're not wise. If they were wise, they would be able to see how the body works, how it relates to nutrition, to the environment, to stress. So smart, but not wise. Hey everybody, Dr. Axe here. Today I have a friend of mine and a guest. It is Dr. Mark Stangler, NMD. And he is, uh, I've been reading his books for years. In fact, he's written books like Natural Cures and uh, and Cancer Outside of the Box, uh, you know, therapies. He's written, actually, Dr. Mark, let me first off ask you, how many books have you written? I think in total it's 30. Yeah, 30 books. And he's been really a pioneer in this sort of natural medicine and natural health industry. He's got a popular radio show. He's got a practice. And again, over 30 books out there he's authored. Dr. Mark, so excited to chat with you today. Hey, great to be with you, Josh. Well, I want to talk about several things. One of the first, though, is I wanted to get into cancer and natural cancer treatments. Obviously, cancer has been at the top of everybody's mind in the health industry for a long time. It's, you know, one of the top three disease killers in the Western world today. Talk to me about, first off, talk to me about what do you believe the root cause of cancer is? And in addition to that, what are some of those holistic treatment methods out there that you find to be most effective? Right, well, it is true what you said. I mean, it's battling with uh, cardiovascular disease to be the number one killer here in America. So, and and take into the fact that 50% of people will have some type of cancer in their lifetime. I mean, it's incredible to think about it. I mean, someone you haven't seen in 10 years that you're, you know, you're starting to talk with them. You just met them after many years. And it's basically when your question is, is what type of cancer have you had? I mean, it's really, it's really ridiculous, but cancer is a breakdown of the body. Um, you know, in medicine, we have this reductionist approach, you have cancer of this organ, you have cancer of this tissue, but from a holistic perspective, I think a more accurate perspective, it's the breakdown of the body on many different levels. And so there's various causes. Uh, We know that the environment is a big cause. Radiation, toxins in the environment, heavy metals, pesticides. I mean, we've got over 20,000 man-made chemicals in the environment. So, you know, some of those are more carcinogenic than others. And so that's a problem. Um, We certainly know that diet, I mean, I put diet, you know, near the top, if not the top, the Western diet sets people up for cancer. Why is that? Well, it's high in simple carbohydrates, Uh, The mechanism is such that you get immune suppression, you get elevation of uh, insulin, which is uh, undebatable. It's a tumor promoter. It's a cancer promoter. So high levels of insulin stimulate uh, the growth, abnormal growth of cells. You know, that's a big deal. Uh, A diet is devoid of nutrients. For for normal cell division in the body, you have to have the proper nutrients, B12, folate, other B vitamins iron and so forth. So if you're deficient nutrients, which the average American is without a doubt, you know, government studies show that Dr. Axe, I know in my, my uh, clinic, we run uh, panels of nutrients, 40 nutrients. Everyone has, you know, multiple deficiencies, pretty much, unless they're into natural health, like you and a lot of our followers eating well, taking supplements. It's not as much of an issue, but the average person has multiple nutritional deficiencies. And so the immune system and your cells, they don't work by magic. The other big one, Dr. Axe, for sure, is the effects of stress. You know, stress is related to everything. So if people have poor stressing, stress coping mechanisms, high cortisol levels over long periods of time, leads to immune suppression, breakdown of the immune system. And this actually has been very well studied at Harvard, and we actually talk about that in our book, Outside the Box, Cancer Therapies. And the other big category we see is hormone imbalance. I mean, when you look at how common breast cancer is, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer in men, thyroid cancer. Hormones are very powerful chemicals. Our body needs to be able to function, to be able to survive. But when they're imbalanced, again, from the diet, the environmental toxins, the xenoestrogens people get in cosmetics and and lotions they're using, uh, it leads to hormone imbalance and that stimulates uh, tissue growth too. And so in the women and men, we see a lot of estrogen dominance. In women, the estrogen is too high relative to the progesterone that causes growth of cells. Progesterone is supposed to keep that in check. We see that because a lot of women are on birth control pills, women on synthetic hormones. Uh, about 40% of women don't ovulate regularly of a premenopausal age, and so the progesterone levels aren't high enough. They have these chemicals in their body from the pesticides and the other chemicals mimicking estrogen at the receptor level. In the men, the testosterone drops over time. 
uh, especially if they're overweight or have prediabetes or diabetes or insulin resistance, the estrogen level increases and you have this again imbalance with estrogen. And so estrogen is one of the culprits also with uh, prostate cancer. And so hormone balance is, is another big category. Yeah, I'm glad you're bringing this up. And let's, let's stay there for just a second. When we're talking about estrogen dominance, talk to me about what sort of diet, what, what, what would a diet look like that's really going to support balanced estrogen levels, keeping those lower, helping the progesterone and testosterone, those hormones raise or be in balance as they should. What, what, what is it? And I'll, obviously, I know that there are a lot of breast cancers that are due to estrogen dominance as well. So talk to us a little bit about the diet, any natural herbs uh, and, and things that go along with that or can support the body in balancing that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we see it so commonly in women, the estrogen dominance, it's a big, big, big problem. And like you said, 85% of breast cancers are estrogen positive. So it's a big deal. And so basically in the diet, there's this whole concept and a lot of people don't understand, it, especially medical doctors actually, and this whole term of phytoestrogens. And so people see the word phyto means plant and then estrogen. So these are compounds and plant, which have a similar biochemistry to estrogen, but it's different than that. I think in part of the you know, grand design of um, our creation, phytoestrogens are what we call amphoteric. So what the research really shows is when you get these phytoestrogens, mainly in plant foods, you know, fruits and vegetables, uh, the best examples would, would be things like ground flaxseed, for example, fermented soy products, not regular soy products. Those are some classic examples. But you get them in common foods, carrots, um, lettuce, all common plant foods do have phytoestrogens. So in a nutshell, what research is showing is if your cell receptors are being overstimulated, these phytoestrogens in plant foods actually have a blocking effect on receptors. Well, that's a good thing. If your receptors are too low uh, in terms of being enhanced, it uptakes estrogen. Well, that's important too, because you need estrogen for many important things in the body. Bone health, for example, cardiovascular health, brain health, skin health, um, and many other factors. So hormones are such you don't want to be too low or too high. But yes, in America, because people aren't eating enough plant foods, um, not enough fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, they're not detoxifying estrogen well. The superfoods really for estrogen detoxification help our liver uh, detoxify estrogen would be the cruciferous vegetables by far. They're the most well studied. They contain compounds called indols and they assist in the detox detoxification pathways of estrogen and not just estrogen. Estrogen actually is a plural term. There's many different types of estrogen in men and women, and some are more carcinogenic than others. Anyways, these cruciferous vegetables or indols, they help to break down these carcinogenic estrogens. And so this is very important. So uh, broccoli, cauliflower, bok choy, um, Brussels sprouts, kale, cabbage, all these foods, which a lot of Americans do not eat on a regular basis, um, are very high in these indoles. So I'm a big fan of the cruciferous vegetables. And then the whole topic of detoxification, you know, in, in holistic medicine, detoxification is very important. In Western medicine, it's really ignored a lot. So we need to support the detox pathways. So besides the diet, eating more organic free range meats, of course, uh, eating the right types of fats, the healthier fats, we have to support detoxification. How do we do that? And you've talked a lot about this besides a purified water source, you know, about 80 to 100 um, ounces a day. Uh, sauna therapy is great. There's different types of saunas. Regular exercise, of course, is very important for sweating. So things that promote detoxification are very important uh, because this is how our body metabolizes hormones like estrogen. But more specific, in terms of the liver, and a lot of people have what we call suboptimal liver function. They don't have liver disease, but their liver uh, pathways aren't working optimally. And so they're not breaking the estrogen compounds and some of the other hormones down effectively. So with our liver, which produces bile stored in the gallbladder, both organs release bile when we eat food, bile actually carries um, the estrogen compounds into the digestive tract. Now, if you have a lack of bile, you're not gonna excrete the estrogen accumulating in the liver effectively. Then it goes into our intestines and our colon. And if you don't have the right microbiome, you know, if your flora is not balanced, and you talk a lot about this, that also plays a role. The microbiome plays a role in metabolizing estrogen. So what they have found over the past, oh, 10 to 15 years, if you don't break the estrogen down properly, if you don't excrete it through proper bowel elimination, so you don't have constipation, 
um, these estrogen, estrogen compounds actually get reabsorbed back through the colon into the bloodstream. And another reason you get estrogen dominance. So regular bowel movements uh, with adequate fiber in the diet, uh, enough water, enough exercise to move the bowels. I mean, it's critical or you can't have proper hormone balance. Yeah, it's critical to so many things you're talking about from thyroid health to fertility to fighting cancer. Uh, you know, I, I do want to stay on the topic of cancer and talk about this. So we, we talked about diet. So getting a lot of those cruciferous vegetables is going to help. In addition, what are some holistic treatments outside of food? I know that I've read over the years and recommended things. I know my mom has done some of these things like uh, different types of chelation. What you know, what, what, what factors or things should be used in chelation if somebody does it? What are your thoughts on hyperbaric and ozone and all the different, anyways, I would love to hear your thoughts on yeah. some of the treatments out there for cancer. Yeah. And we use all those at our clinic here in Encinitas, California. So, well, the first group of treatments I really like a lot, they're called the oxidative treatments. Okay. Oxidative is a term. And so the, the classic treatments would be like hyperbaric oxygen, like you mentioned, very, very powerful, basically using pressure in the hyperbaric chambers, you know, you're increasing the oxygenation of the cells, which makes it harder for cancer cells to thrive. Um, also, we use a lot in our clinic, um, high dose intravenous vitamin C. There's a lot of good published studies, which show that a couple of things. A, they reduce the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. And I've written about this in my books. It's kind of a shame that oncologists and oncology centers aren't recommending it. I and mean, it's a fraction of the price of conventional therapies, but many good studies shown it reduces the effects, the side effects, not the good effects, but the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. So for example, large studies have shown that you can um, prevent extreme fatigue if you're getting intravenous vitamin C, it reduces body pain, reduces depression, reduces digestive problems associated with chemotherapy and radiation, uh, and, and, and insomnia. So a lot of things so I see 95% of patients come to our clinic, they're getting some type of conventional treatment. And so what I tell the patients, we have a couple of things we have to focus on. A, get you through your treatments, you know, about serious side effects, right? And better quality of life. Number two, work better now and in the future, addressing the root cause of why you got cancer in the first place. Unfortunately, conventional medicine does a very poor job of that, kind of get your treatments and hope you don't, you're not 50% of people that relapse over the next, you know, five to 10 years. Uh, C, optimize immune function, support detoxification during the treatments and afterwards, and then help with cellular regeneration. So we do a lot of high dose intravenous vitamin C, usually 50,000 milligrams for the treatment. We do that one to two times a week. Usually people do about 15 to 20 treatments. More advanced treatment, we'll do ozone therapy intravenously beforehand. And that's kind of unique therapy, which is very popular, by the way, in countries like Cuba, Germany, Switzerland. A lot of European countries has hundreds of published studies on it, but we're oxygenating the blood, which again, makes it a more difficult environment for cancer cells to thrive. And what we do is we draw the patient's blood out, goes into a sterile IV bag. Then we infuse their blood with medical grade ozone, which really is, is three oxygen atoms, uh, kind of switch it around, move it around, uh, let the red blood cells soak it up and then drip it back into the patient. And then it floods the body you know, with the ozone therapy. So we use those a lot. If patients are ex experiencing a lot of extreme fatigue from their treatments, we'll do some treatments with uh, just nutrients like B vitamins and magnesium, help their cells produce energy better. So those are some of the treatments we do a lot, uh, Dr. Axe, but there's also some very key supplements. In the world of cancer, as you know, there isn't a lot of supplements which have human studies on. Now there's a lot of studies on, you know, in test tubes, we call uh, in, in, in vivo, we've got a lot of animal studies and those are better than nothing, but they don't always, you know, work out the same actual people. So we focus on supplements, which have good human studies. I know you're a big fan. You've written in recent books on mushroom extracts. So in places like China and Japan, it's very interesting for many decades. Now, oncologists have been using mushroom extracts, not only orally, but also even uh, intravenously to help the immune system to fight cancer better. And they can do things like enhance natural killer cells, which seek out cancer cells in the blood and try to attack and kill them. So oncologists recommend these studies showed about 50% of people that have cancer. Here in America, I mean, it's less than 1% of oncologists who recommend them, even though we have hundreds of published studies. So one, for example, known as Coriolis versicolor, common name is turkey's tail, 
It has over 100 published studies on it, including studies showing not only the beneficial immune activation that's caused by it, but reducing the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. So you take these mushroom extracts like turkey's tail, it helps to support your immune system, so it's not breaking down so rapidly. Uh, you're not as prone to getting secondary infections, helps your body fight the cancer better, but reduces the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. The other one well studied is mitaki, uh, also known as grafola. And mitaki, again, it's a cancer drug in Japan and China. It's actually registered as a cancer drug. Here in America, you can get it as a dietary supplement. Same thing, shown to really augment the immune system, reduce the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. So things like this to me, and there's other ones, are kind of a no-brainer. Why would you not use them with patients? They don't interfere with the treatments. They help the immune system. They help the body fight cancer. Um, so to me, these are just like no-brainer supplements. Yeah, mushrooms are amazing. Talk a little bit about beta-glucans. Or what, what, what are some of the things that make them so beneficial, and how do they work? Yeah, so these mushroom extracts contain compounds called beta-glucans. These are kind of like polysaccharides, you know, sugar chains, if you will. And so when you take them and they get into our digestive tract, they activate the immune system. Now, again, you've done a good job in your books of talking about how 70% of the immune system originates in the gut. You know, we have this gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So these beta-glucans get into our gut and they tell this lymphoid tissue to produce these specialized white blood cells, like natural killer cells, for example. They also get absorbed into our bloodstream and activate the immune system, tell the bone marrow, hey, make more of these white blood cells. So these beta-glucans are unique in that you can find them in other foods, even in yeast, for example, but in terms of cancer, there's unique beta-glucans you find in these well-studied medicinal mushrooms like Coriolis, like maitake, for example, that enhance the immune system. They have little different configurations depending on the mushroom extract, but very powerful in activating the immune system. And it's interesting, you look at traditional uh, Asian medicine, uh, like Chinese medicine, and you've talked about this in your recent book too. Um, the Chinese have known and the Japanese have known for thousands of years, when they use mushrooms, they would use them mainly in teas. Now they use them in foods too, in the diet, and, and that can be helpful. But as teas, the hot water melts what's called this chitin wall, uh, the swallow mushrooms where the beta-glucans, once it's melted, it releases these beta-glucans. So they, they found out, you know, they figured out using the teas works really well in activating the immune system. And then today's, you know, sometimes concentrated supplements have a hot water extracts so you can concentrate these beta-glucans. So very, very interesting. Powerful. I know when my mom was sick, she took a lot of reishi. She took some cordyceps and other mushrooms too. And uh, yeah, we saw tremendous results. Well, one of the things I was actually reading an article on your website, uh, Doc, that really talked about fun funguses causing cancer or, or the overuse of antibiotics. Uh, we know that there's obviously a very close correlation. A lot, of, a lot of the topics you've talked about are in the category of the immune system. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about what, what, what does that mean? Like, like, talk, talk to me about fungus and yeast and antibiotics and how those actually can increase cancer risk and what to do about them and some of the things that are causing, uh, you know, um, this yeast and fungal overgrowth. Yeah. So very common in Americans, like you said, from using antibiotics, excess alcohol and sugar intake, drinking chlorinated water, you know, your microbiome is not in balance. And so we all have a certain amount of fungi or yeast in our microbiome. Nowadays, actually experts say that, you know, there's a, a very distinct fungi microbiome in our gut and it does serve purposes. However, uh, like other bacteria and things in our gut, it can flourish, it can overgrow, it can become opportunistic. And so again, people are on antibiotics, they wipe out the good flora, which really are like prison guards, keeping you know, the prisoners in check, so to speak. And then they start to flourish. And then when we get an overgrowth of yeast or fungi in our gut, again, our immune system reacting against that, which is also not good for autoimmune diseases, but we're tapping our immune system you know, for this overgrowth of, of, of yeast and fungi when it should be working, of course, on, you know, working on cancer cells and other microbes our body's exposed to. So it does deplete the immune system. It creates an inflammatory response. And cancer, like any chronic disease, is also a disease of chronic inflammation. I mean, that's been very well shown. They've done studies where they monitor people's C-reactive protein and infl inflammation marker from the liver. And people that have higher levels of C-reactive protein with cancer don't do as well. People who have lower levels do better. And that's why we've got to address the inflammation, get the fungal levels down, 
address the diet, address the nutrient deficiencies, the stress, get that inflammation down. It's important so you can start getting normal cell division again. Makes sense. You know, one other aspect, we've talked a lot about immunity. Let's talk about detoxification when it comes to the treatment of cancer. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things you recommend? Are there any herbs? Are there any treatments or anything specific when it comes to toxicity in cancer? Any studies showing that toxicity or any anything to your knowledge uh, showing that that is a contributor to cancer? Well, there's certainly a number of toxic compounds uh, shown to be associated with increased risk of cancer, you know, range from some heavy metals like arsenic, you know, lead, mercury, things like that. Um, again, with 20,000 man-made chemicals, I mean, we're yeah. just kind of bombarded. It's so, yeah, it's a lot. So, no, I think you're right. I think in terms of a preventative program or someone recovering from cancer or someone who has cancer, you've got to incorporate detoxification. So what I do with patients, honestly, depends on their state of health. If someone is undergoing conventional treatments, they're just not feeling well, it's hard for me to get them to drink, you know, a lot of green, freshly, you know, made green juices and stuff like that. They're better off making protein shakes, maybe like a collagen shake, adding some organic powdered greens in with it, something that's workable for them. But regardless, we've got to get these phytonutrients in their system as high of a level as we can, because these phytonutrients found on plant foods are tremendous in helping the immune system. I usually put people on products which support liver function. So a mixture of herbs like milk thistle, dandelion root, artichoke root, all very well studied supporting liver function. I'm a big fan of glutathione, you know, the super antioxidant our body produces. You do get small amounts in green vegetables as well, uh, especially after the treatments. Um, glutathione is very unique because it does help every cell detoxify, but even more specifically liver and kidney cells. And remember for organs beside our skin, the liver and kidneys is where most of the detoxification takes place. So very, very important. And glutathione is unique in this. When my patients are done their chemotherapy radiation treatments, I actually put them on a series of intravenous glutathione followed by oral glutathione because glutathione is very unique in that our cells are designed so that glutathione actually helps with DNA repair. So when people are getting chemotherapy and radiation, yeah, it's killing cancer cells, hopefully, but it's killing, you know, healthy cells too. And of course, you know, those types of treatments damage cell DNA and DNA is what controls to a large degree your cell division and cancer is a disease of abnormal cell division. So glutathione actually goes in and our body uses it every day to repair DNA. So quite a powerful thing, something people get from foods, super green foods like broccoli, for example, you can take it in supplements. So I really rely on glutathione a lot. Yeah, I love that. And and again, I, I love the I love your approach to uh, you know, ways of being a you know complementary or in certain cases, you know, uh, you know, of, of course, and as a preventative cancer treatment, uh, using as things like mushrooms, using uh, oxygen therapy and all of these other things, I think is so important. One of the things that I have uh, seen recently and I've seen you write about is our current medical system, sort of the way the whole thing is set up, the way doctors are trained today. Um, you wrote an article recently and it said, doctors' lack of training could put your life at risk. Can you talk about this term, iatrogenic disease? And also, uh, over the globe, you said 11 million deaths a year are due to complications uh, from poor diet and nutrition. So anyways, I'm just curious about in your article, doctor's lack of training could put your life at risk. What are you alluding to there? Yeah, it's a very good point. Well, in traditional medical schools, I went to a medical school that combined both, you know, regular medicine, people are familiar with conventional medicine combined with a holistic. Uh, so I kind of have a good understanding of both sides of medicine. Yeah, the fact that the root cause of most disease in our world is related to diet, nutritional deficiencies, toxin exposure, and the effects of stress. The fact the matter is, we always hear about genetics, genetics. Well, genetics really account uh, for a very small percent as a primary cause of cancers. So in the world of cancer right now, there's a lot of folks on genetics, but they have it backwards, actually. I'll tell you why. Because in cancer, the main theory is, is that there's genetic mutations which allow for abnormal cell division and so forth. And while that's true, it's, it, the problem is they're not addressing the reason why people get the genetic damage to begin with. That goes back again to the diet, the stress, the environmental toxins, uh, a lot of things that we can control through diet and lifestyle. So they're 
missing that major first step and they just focus on the after effects of it, uh, which is kind of bizarre really because you get cell DNA changes and mutations, which yes, can lead to abnormal cell division. But again, what's triggering that? What's causing that? And so that's why I hold this at doctors, nutritional oriented doctors like yourself, we're going a step before that. We're addressing the triggers as to what's triggering the cancer formation, what's triggering the autoimmunity, what's triggering the fatigue, what's triggering the hormone balance. In medicine, everything's after the fact. It's really, really more like what we call emergency medicine. You know, the disease is already set in. We're using Band-Aid treatments for the most part to try and calm it down quickly, but we're not treating the root causes. And even the treatments that are being used for the most part, they're not good long-term approaches. So iatrogenic caused by doctors. I mean, caused by doctors. So when you're seeing your primary care doctor and he's not going into detail what you're eating, what you're doing for your exercise, he's not checking your nutrient levels, like 70% of Americans are low in vitamin D, which, you know, there's just a ton of papers out there showing the increase your risk of all the common cancers from breast to colon to prostate, uh, you name it, a very simple thing to fix if you know it's a problem. And doctors still aren't doing this. You have deficient levels, let's say a B12 or folate. Maybe you're a vegetarian, maybe you drink too much alcohol. You need those for normal cell division. So when doctors aren't training these basic things like diet, like detoxification, uh, testing for environmental toxins, take care of them while a person's younger. I mean, I can't tell you how many people even the last six months come to my clinic where their mercury levels are off the charts because they're eating sushi all the time, like ahi. And they're, you know, the mercury levels are sky high. And we know studies show increase the risk of cancers, autoimmune disease, thyroid disease, even diabetes are studies showing it. So doctors are more trained really in emergency medicine. And so not good preventive medicine, not good nutritional medicine. And so if you don't change the foundation, uh, the foundation of the cellular health, of the tissue health, health of the blood, you're not going to change fundamentally why the person's getting sick or why they are sick. Yeah. You know, one of the things is I've, as I've, I've read and I've reflected on so much of this as well, you look at how many hours or how many course hours of nutrition training most medical doctors get. It's literally, this isn't made up. It's zero, zero total hours of training. And so what's, what's crazy is if you think about it, if you want to get healthy, like, like all our doctors have studied is, uh, is sickness and disease and how to change a symptom. And that's essentially the, the, the system today. And I think about it like this, would you go and invest your money with somebody who had only studied poverty and they had never studied wealth building and investing in stocks and their whole thing? Not a chance in this world yet. That's what almost everybody is doing because these people sound smart, but they've studied the completely wrong topic. It's like, anyways, I just, it, it, it's mind blowing to think about how backwards, you know, in, in fact, one of the crazy things it's called, some people have called people that study nutrition and, 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 and supplementation and herbs and all of these things, uh, alternative medicine when really, you know, medication should be the alternative. It should be, Hey, you do everything you can diet and lifestyle wise. And if none of that works, then the alternative is a drug or surgery. It's the, it's the second line, not the first line of defense. I know you're on the same page, but it's just sort of crazy how backwards we are. It's a backwards system. It really hasn't changed. When my patients come in here from their primary doctors, from their oncologists, whatever, I mean, they're not getting anything on nutrition um, or nutrients. I mean, that is for sure. And so, yeah, it's kind of a sad state of affairs. Now you can see how the mindset, the tunnel vision sets in. You know, so being trained also in pharmaceutical medications as a doctor, I mean, patients come in, you know, with a certain symptom or condition you get, you really, it's not that difficult. I mean, if you got a certain condition, really, you may got two, three, four options of drugs you can give them. It's not rocket science. You could teach someone in grade nine, really have prescribed pharmaceutical. I mean, it's just the truth. Okay. And so <clears throat> you give them one of the drugs for that condition. If it matches up, they might get better short term, especially if it's a chronic condition. If it's an acute infection, yeah, it's bacterial. It could help them. I mean, it may just resolve the problem. But for the most part, medications are a band aid approach. And when you went back to what you're saying before, iatrogenic, I mean, look, the research is out. The amount of people, uh, at least a minimum, a minimum 100,000 people die every year in the United States as a result of side effects from pharmaceutical medications. So 
I mean, pharmaceutical medications are handed out like candy in doctor's offices. I mean, it's, it's out of control. But, you know, that's how they're trained. It's tunnel vision. I mean, it's drugs, it's surgery, or if you don't know what the problem is, you know, blame it on the patient. Tell them they have depression or some psychiatric condition. I mean, that's unfortunately the way things are done. So I think there's a lot of doctors in America who are very smart. Now, what I mean by that is if you gave them a test on a certain condition, on lab testing, differential diagnosis, you gave them tests on physics and math and everything, they would do very, very well. But you know what? They're not wise. If they were wise, they would be able to see how the body works, how it relates to nutrition, to the environment, to stress. So smart, but not wise. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. These are great, great points, Doc. Uh, I wanted to talk about a few other things here. And one is I have loved your books over the years. You've written about herbal therapy, natural medicine, supplementation. Walk me through, what are your, I have two questions. One, what are your, the probably five of the top herbs you prescribe and recommend the most? And herbs could be herbals category, could be uh, mushrooms, could be herbs, could be spices. So in that category, the top five you typically mm -hmm. recommend. And on the other side, what are the top five nutrients yeah, you typically recommend? Start, start well, with you. Yeah, yeah. So those are good questions. Her question, see, you can show we didn't uh, script this, so I'm going off the top of my head here. So as I'm sitting here in my clinic right now thinking, you know, what I get the patients so in terms of herbs, well, certainly use a lot of turmeric extract. I know you do too. Why not? A lot of people have pain and inflammation, you yeah. know, tremendous for that, very effective, very safe. There's hundreds of studies showing it has anti-cancer properties. That's why the drug companies are studying it very heavily right now. They're trying to isolate one little compound on there that they can patent, just Google UCLA. They've been researching this very intensively. They know turmeric has anti-cancer properties, so they're, they're trying to make a drug out of it and they're doing studies. So turmeric's very high. Um, you know, in terms of other herbs, I use ginger a lot. A lot of people do get gas and bloating. It's also a good anti-inflammatory herb, it does help with circulation. Um, you know, one herb I use quite a bit, Josh, that most people are not familiar with, it's called gentian root, spelled G-E-N-T-I-A-N. And it's a bitter herb. It's been used a lot in European medicine. Chinese medicine has their own version of gentian too. It's a bitter herb. And so what it does is when you take it with patients, it stimulates their digestive organs. So studies show uh, if you take it in liquid, it activates the bitter receptors in the tongue. Even if you take it in capsule, it activates bitter receptors in the stomach. They've done studies sh showing that. And so we get so many people with digestive problems, irritable bowel syndrome, indigestion, acid reflux. Gentian helps to activate the digestive organs, you know, like your stomach acid, the motility, your pancreatic enzyme output. It stimulates uh, the liver and gallbladder to put out bile. So that's one I use a lot as well. Um, in terms of other herbs I use quite commonly, I do like cinnamon extract, certain types of cinnamon extract, of course, well studied for uh, blood sugar balancing, like type 2 diabetes. I will use that as a food, a spice, also in a food, you know, it's good for people that have poor circulation as well. You know, these uh, uh, people in China in the winter time, they, they, they load up on the cinnamon and teas and capsules and other extracts. It's great for peripheral circulation. You know, you get cold extremities, so it's very good for that. Uh, those are three, you know, off the top of my head, I use a lot in terms of nutrients. I mean, we do a lot of testing. So we see so many people with a vitamin D deficiency. I mean, I'm sure that's number one. We see a lot of people, surprisingly, with omega-3 deficiency. We see a lot of people on the blood test. We do what's called the omega check and it looks at their EPA and DHA levels and gives the total omega-3 fatty acid. I'm shocked how many people are low in omega-3. So we see that a lot. I see a lot of women uh, under the age of 50 low in iron and low in iron stores known as ferritin. We see that a fair amount. We see a fair amount of people low or deficient in B12, you know, people on PPI medications for acid reflux, uh, people avoid, you know, uh, you know, meat products real strictly, uh, people under high stress, people drink a lot of alcohol. So we use, you know, that nutrient quite a bit. Uh, chromium, we use that in formulas for people with blood sugar problems, uh, food uh, cravings. We use a lot of the amino acid metabolite known as 5-hydroxytryptophan. You know, so many people with um, anxiety and depression. Uh, we see that a lot. We use the amino acid GABA quite a bit, people with anxiety, especially, you know, during this COVID time period. Um, those are some of the ones, you know, just re re routinely used. And of course, I see a lot of people 
as you mentioned with cancer and so the mushroom extracts you know going back to, back to those law coils a lot of maitake a lot of astragalus i do like the reishi like you like it too reishi or reishi people pronounce it it's a very good overall tonic uh very effective cordyceps we like to use people with chronic fatigue uh very effective for that it's also very effective for asthma so those are some of the ones that that we use I mean, those are, those are, those are great recommendations. And I, and I'm with you, you know, I, I want to just hit on a few of those one, you know, iron in premenopausal women, uh, you know, low iron, those ferritin levels tends to be low and so often, you know, borderline anemic. And, you know, and so I think that's a really good call out. If you're a woman and you have low energy, so often it's either thyroid or it's, or, 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 or it's, it, it's anemia, you know, there, there's a, uh, blood deficiency, as they call it in Chinese medicine. And another one, um, astragalus, you know, astragalus is one of the top five prescribed herbs, probably in Chinese medicine for everything from gut health to immune health in a big way uh, and other things. So anyways, that's another one. Uh, what, what do you typically recommend astragalus for, for people? Yeah. So astragalus, we use a lot. Uh, we do use it in cancer formulas for sure. We use it in people who have chronic viral infections. I mean, mm. astragalus is one of the better herbs to use long-term, you know, certain herbs tip, Traditionally, we use more short-term, you know, like a, people think of echinacea and golden seal. Usually we use those more short-term, but stragulus is great for long-term use, especially people with chronic viral infections. Maybe you got yeah. a virus, some kind of chronic thing, you got cancer. Maybe you're the kind of person who has asthma and you get a respiratory tract infection. In the winter, it flares your asthma up. So people, the history of that, we put them on stragulus during the wintertime. It works great. It's also used in Chinese medicine, you know, prevent and treat asthma as well as a lung tonic. So um, I think that's an, it's an excellent uh, herb to use long-term for sure. Yeah, agreed. And a lot of people don't realize this. You've got, especially in the family with, with adaptogens, you've got the short-term use like ginseng, which mm -hmm. is just so powerful typically for men, some women over the age of 50 or 60. And then you've got some of the ones that are more gentle, like the astra like astragalus, like ashwagandha that are better for long-term use is a great point. Yeah, I should say that you asked me about the top herbs. Definitely ashwagandha is one we use almost every day. Now, why is that? Well, I mean, you know, people do the effects of stress. Um, a lot of people have what we call adrenal dysfunction. It means an imbalance of the stress hormones. And the typical pattern we see, because we do a lot of salivary and urinary hormone testing, uh, we see a lot of people with high cortisol throughout the day and low DHEA. And the two hormones work together, together to modulate stress, your immune system and inflammation. And so when the cortisol is too high, the immune system breaks down, you won't control inflammation, you get insomnia, tissue breakdown. And when the DHA is low, you don't get that regenerative effect that you get from that adrenal hormone. So ashwagandha is unique in that when you look at the human published studies on it, it's very impressive. It's been shown to decrease your cortisol level by about 25%, your blood cortisol level by 25% in 30 days, but also simultaneously increases the DHEA level. And that's really the pattern most people have. They have low DHEA, usually the first hormone to build to burn out. The cortisol is too high. So, you know, it works to balance the two out. So we use it a lot and studies show it helps people with fatigue. It helps insomnia. It helps anxiety. So that's one I'm sure, you know, I'm pretty much recommending most days. Yeah, I think it's a great recommendation. I want to encourage everybody, hey, check out Dr. Mark's website. It's Mark Stangler, Stangler spelled S-T-E-N-G-L-E-R, markstangler.com. Dr. Mark is known as America's natural doctor. Uh, he is a uh, has a naturopath degree, and he has worked with uh, people, helping them overcome everything from uh, diabetes to hormonal issues, to digestive issues, to uh, holistic uh, you know, cancer treatments partnered with, uh, you know, oftentimes other, uh, other physicians in the, those treatments. But anyways, he's got a great website, has a radio show. It's been featured on television many times and has a, just a lot of, how many books have you authored again? Yeah. Yeah. I think around 30. Yeah. Th th 30 books. You're catching up to me though. I think you've been, you've been working hard. I'm closer to 10. So I, you know what, well, I got a long way to go. I got a long way to go. Well, I want to say thanks everybody for joining us today. I want to say thanks again to Dr. Mark Stengler. And also you can check out his books on amazon.com. Just search Dr. Mark Stengler. And he has written books on numerous things, everything from fighting cancer to natural cures, to healing the prostate, to balancing the hormones and so much more. I want to say again, Dr. Mark, thanks for being on the show today. Hey, thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Apps. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. 
Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein.